Hey guys, what's up? Matt here from Coffees for Closers. We have a very special yet somewhat exclusive podcast for everyone today. We have Will Hinkson in town from the US. We have Mr. Pat Stewart from Canine Paradigm fame. Um, and that one YouTube video that we did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that we said we we're going to do regularly one yeah. time. Roll regularly enough. If we do I mean, this is year, two. Yeah. Yeah, this is two. Well, we did another one, but it didn't record. Yeah. <laughs> My bad, yeah. My bad. Booze's <laughs> fault. Anyway, so uh, uh, everyone here is part of Sales Sniper now. Everyone here is ex-Special Operations. The only one who should be here is Ben. However, we didn't have a fourth chair. <laughs> So, That's a logistics problem. Yeah, there was a logistics issue. I blame Ben because he is the CEO. Yeah, it was, it was Ben's, Ben's fault. Yeah. He had one, one job. Um, so what we're going to talk about is sales, persuasion, military, probably lots and lots of Anchorman references. And uh, yeah, enjoy. Ex-Special Forces sniper turned entrepreneur. I've scaled numerous businesses to eight figures. My name is Matt Ryder. This is my podcast. And I'm telling you to put that coffee down down. All right. So, Will, when did you get in? Uh, I got in this morning. So, I've been up for roughly coming up on like a day and three quarters with about three hours of sleep. Okay. Which is- You know, it's time for a little mini Red Bull. Time for a five-hour energy drink. Yeah, they say it's the best formula for a good podcast is is sleep deprivation. Well, the last one you had COVID. I had COVID. I don't even remember what got asked and what I said. Nobody should listen to that podcast. This one remains to be seen. We'll put the um, link up here. <laughs> yeah, the one <laughs> that just says don't listen to it. So if you click on that, that's on you. That's like the, uh, your phone has been in, has a virus. You should click on this. Like, you know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not aware of the websites that cause that. However, I have heard of them. What um, do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> something to do with the hamster, I don't know. Um, okay, so uh, you guys have sort of not really met. No, we just met outside. Yeah. Congratulations on the enormity of your success of, you know, being the tripod in the pyramid. So I'd love to, I'd love uh, Will to give everyone a background of yourself and then pack and learn. And we can all learn that we're all relatively similar human beings. Yeah. So spent 10 years, special operations community of that time. Five of that was in the Marine Corps, came up through as a recon Marine, uh, was there as kind of like the transition into MARSOC happened and all that stuff. Did a whole bunch of deployments there, got out, thought I was going to be a travel writer, went back to school, was surfing in Southern California twice a day. And then got a f- call from an old friend who's like, hey, man, I've got this kind of thing that I'm on overseas. We're working for the folks that we're working for. You want to come over? And I was like, mm, yeah. yeah it's very vague to say we're working for the folks. And have, they, have they changed names numerous times? I'm not even sure what you're talking about. <laughs> so he's like, hey, it'll take you about nine months to get this clearance. In that time, I'll plug you into some stateside stuff. So I ended up kind of training folks that were getting ready to deploy, doing that with a bunch of really good friends. And then deployed a whole bunch more after that for the next five years, got out and then started up my first business. Uh, We've talked about this. Matt and I have a shockingly similar background. So Mm -hmm. I got out and I was like, ah, cool. I have no, I have a business degree, which is basically that degree should have said speed and Googling before the timer runs out (laughs) because that's how I answered all those questions. So started up a gym, built that up, then sold that to a venture capital firm, then was CMO. By the way. Incredibly impressive to sell a gym to a venture capital. <laughs> I, so that was a bit of dumb luck, if I'm yeah. honest about it. Oh, I believe it. So it was <laughs> it was pure, because no venture capital firm is like, oh yeah, I want a series of gyms. Yeah. What I would like a series want. of poorly cash flowing, low profit entities that require a tremendous amount of people and infrastructure to run. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Sounds As perfect. you well know. Yeah. No, no, we got lucky. So that one was interesting, right? Because I think in a gym, as you well know, like you can run that as well as you possibly can. It's still a tough business to make tough. work. So I was in a town where they had, it was like our next biggest, I don't know, rival or whatever you want to call it. It's like gyms, who cares? But they were like, you know, kind of one of our folks that we were competing against and like total, total adjustable market, all that stuff. They had partnered with a VC firm. They had a national idea. They were going national with it mm. and they wanted to acquire the next, like the we were their target, right? That, they wanted the to, to own yeah. Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is where it was. So because of that, they, the they started to approach. I got a little bit lucky. They thought they were going to just steamroll me and they would have, I would have gotten just absolutely crushed. The, the X factor into this is my brother-in-law. My whole wife's family is much smarter than I am. So he was the, at the time he was the top mergers and acquisitions attorney for software companies okay, that's in handy. Chicago. <laughs> that's yeah. handy. So he, uh, he walked me through that sale. 
It was an incredibly frustrating experience for me. It had a good outcome, but the whole time, like I, I would have gotten just annihilated. Yeah. And they, they knew that they just didn't expect it. So I got lucky. Uh, then my daughter was born, became a full-time sales guy. Cause I was like, I can't run a company and be a good dad at the time. Like I just knew, like I, I kind of overly mm-hmm. commit yeah, and then just go hard in the paint as we probably all do. And I, I was very concerned at that point in time that I was going to be a good dad. So I was like, oh, I'll go to work. For what I thought I was going to do. It's like, yeah, I'll go work for somebody else, help grow their company for, you know, three to five years until mm-hmm. my daughter goes to school. And then at that point, I will have thought of something of the next venture, make sure it doesn't compete with whatever I've been doing just out of, you know, integrity and being a semi-decent human. And then I'll go start that up and, and go from there, which all changed. And here I am. Yeah. And Pat? Uh, similar rundown. Well, not dissimilar, I suppose. <laughs> Shocking. Yeah, 12 years in Special Forces went straight 12 into- 12 is more than 10. It is. It's okay. too long. 12 just- and a half. <laughs> 12 and a half if we're going to push it. <laughs> uh, I broke my back in 2011. And so that was kind of like I was on the downward spiral from there. So I stuck around for four years after that and was on like a critical skills waiver doing, you know, niche stuff that they couldn't. It started out, they were like, oh, Pat, will look after you and- like keep you around. But then the guy who was meant to replace me got killed in action. So it was like, oh, like we do, we do actually need you to stay here. So yeah, I stuck around and then kind of ventured into the dog space and was into that sort of, you know, long story short was over the the four years that I stayed in and couldn't deploy, but was in training roles and, and admin, like I was the platoon side, like I was the sniper platoon sergeant. I basically kind of figured out how to turn my hobby into a job. And my wife was a really successful uh, tattooist at the time. Um, and so when I left the army, it was like, we're going to have ki- a kid, same deal, we'll, you know, and I was going to be mostly home dad and she, like, she was going to have a career and I was going to have a job. And then it, a few years in, it kind of turned around and her body started to fall apart because, you know, tattooing is a really limited thing. You can only do it so much. And then I started a podcast uh, with a friend of mine, Glenn, and it went the other way. It was like, okay, now you, she's got a job that she tattoos now and again. And then I had this career in dogs, but COVID just fit for everybody. Right. So like mostly I was working in the States, teaching seminars, that kind of stuff. It's really limited in what I do. Like it's not very, what I do in dogs is not very popular in Sydney or in Australia really. So I have a really limited kind of market here and the U S market. It's worldwide. It's a huge market, but it, like in any one spot, it's not really there. So it requires a lot of travel. So COVID just kind of put an end to that. And now that like, you know, pandemic's mostly over and we can travel again, I'm just kind of not in a position to do that. Like I just don't, and I don't really want to be traveling right now. It just doesn't seem like a wise time to be constantly going overseas. You know, it, like two weeks of every six doesn't seem like a wise time with a six month old baby. We had, you know, we had another kid and like the idea that, you know, there's a war in Europe currently, it just doesn't seem like- Wait, a- there is. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't seem like a wise time to be spending big chunks of time from f- away from home. So that's um, interesting, man. Like, because I think I, one of the things that I resonate with is like, for me, it was like, oh, I shouldn't be running a company because I'll be a bad dad. And that mm. actually switched for me. Mm. Right. And I, and I kind of found that, that homeostasis or balance that worked for me. What was the thing that shifted for you where you're like, oh, I don't want to be traveling anymore? Well, so when Rip, my oldest son, was a baby baby, I, you know, no one wanted me to travel. No one knew me. So it wasn't on the cards. And I was home a lot and spent, you know, like the, the kind of time that you can't get back uh, with kids. And, you know, so like my current, my current baby son, Axel, he's six, seven months old. And they're different every week. It's a different, yeah, the, yeah. The, the milestones happen every week. And I just didn't want to miss any. And as Rip got older and he was probably three before I started, you know, really traveling and would be gone for two, three weeks at a time regularly, not that much changes in that time. And he can handle missing you. And he doesn't like, you know, it's not as big an impact on a kid uh, to be gone for that period of time. But like right now, you know, a, a two weeks to a six month old is a big percentage of their life. Yeah. And they really change. And so- I, I find myself thinking pretty critically about you know, when someone invites me to come overseas, money's not a big motivator for me. I know that's a, that, that's a weird thing to say <gasps> on this podcast, in this <laughs> business. <laughs> right? um, and I've never, you know, I make plenty of money. I make a lot of money, but it's Which never, is probably why it's not a big thing. Yeah. And, and, 
I say from this incredible position of privilege, you know, having an army pension and blah, 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 like, oh, I'm not worried about the money. And it's because I'm like, I get a bunch of it, right? Like, I, and, I, and, and, you know, I work my I'm not worried about watches either. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, or new cars. Yeah, but no. so yeah. it became more now, like I find myself when people ask me to, you know, travel to do stuff, I'm like, how much money is in that? Because like, it's got to be worth my while to go. Where it used to be like, yeah, well, that sounds like fun. Like, why not? I'll, I'll totally come. Now I've like, I, I do a big cost benefit analysis and it's much, you know, it, there's a lot more in the stay home pile than there is in the travel pile uh, or column. So yeah, that's that's kind of it. And, and so, you know, I've come on board here because I just like hanging out with Matt. <laughs> and he, he made up a fake job for me. Yep. So. <laughs> but you're doing really well. Which I'm killing it at, yeah, my fake work. job. Yeah. yeah so, I bought, we got a chair. Yeah, I got a chair <laughs> I mean, that's a winner as it is. I set up, a, I bagged a spot in the office. <laughs> <laughs> I think, so I think, I think it's, it's, it's really funny though, because a lot of like mine and yours progression and mine and yours progression, like we've obviously known each other for, I mean, God, it's got to be... Uh, 15 years, like that, yeah. maybe 17 years. You were like at my house when I came home from Afghanistan in 2005. Yeah. So yeah, like. Was that at the party? Yeah. So like, the first time I met Pat, right? It's like, Me and Pat were not friends to begin with, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a little bit chill, more chilled out than what he used to be. I'm probably what? a lot less annoying than what I used to be. And uh, I remember I was wearing, like we were, at, we were at a party and I was just wearing like a Letterman jacket because it was like a USA high school. It was back to school. Back to school. So I had my Letterman jacket from high school, which obviously a very rare thing over here, but I still had it. And I wore it and I just had that with like shorts and no shirt. And he goes, this is the first time I ever met him. He goes, you're not fat. You're just blank. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, who the f is this guy? <laughs> really? Yeah. So that was the first time. But like, but then like, you know, we became friends and we we can so we can tell the story <laughs> offline about about how Pat became to respect me as a human. But um and then sort of like I we became closer friends like as we got out of the army and I started training and stuff like that. But then um like we had a very distinct at the same time, both of us were like, Pat was like, oh, I'm going to try and be the guy in the dog industry. And I was like, I'm going to try and be the guy in the sales industry. Both of us had the exact same approach, which is we would just do a metric boatload of content, which is purely designed to give value. And then from there, we will try and take market share. It was the identical strategy. I would say Pat was probably a year ahead of me. And I sort of, I think I, pro I got the idea from stuff that you were doing. I was like, oh, fuck, that's working over there. Yeah. And so Pat very quickly took a lot of market share within what you were doing. Yeah. Do you want to kind of explain that? Well, so we, you know, a friend of mine, Glenn, who I was training dogs with, you know, just kind of, white work is tricky, you know, you need multiple people and that kind of stuff. So we were just kind of, we had no business interest together at all, but we were just, would train dogs. Uh, he did a podcast with someone else and I think he got the bug for it and was like, hey, you want to start a podcast? And, and I was, and, and in the dog industry at the time, there weren't many at all. And so we How were big is early the dog in. industry. I think that's oh, a question. Oh, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Oh, yeah. If okay. you want to count pets, it's madness. Yeah. Like if you count pets, it's a multi-billion dollar industry when you get into food and all of that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, he got the bug for the podcast and was like, hey, you want to start a podcast? And we had a couple of false starts, but then eventually we got it going and it became really popular. Um, and so in the dog space, it's probably the most, or not the most, it's one of the most popular podcasts. We get about 40,000 downloads an episode. Okay, um, nice. Yeah, and that kind of just sort of, bought me authority in that space. Like I'm good. I, I am good on the tools, but uh, I'm a better teacher and that's what you know, to people, like I'm better at instructing how to do that kind of stuff. And so it gave me the leg up of people being able to go like, yeah, he knows what he's talking about, but he's doing a good job of explaining it to me in audio only. Imagine what he could do like with dogs. And I'm, I've got a lot of online. I've got a lot of me actually training dogs content, but people need help physically. So that's kind of the limitation, the bottleneck when you talk business wise is like, I create, and I got told not to do this by my mentor. My mentor in dog training was this guy, Bart Bellin, who, you know, is arguably the most famous best dog trainer ever. And right when he kind of trained me, he was like, I'm not going to do seminars anymore. So it was like perfect timing. Like I just kind of slotted in and got to steal his credibility essentially. Yeah, or nice. he, he lent to me his credibility. But the issue is, you know, no matter how much content you put out, and I have an online course, it's done really well. That got us through COVID and all that kind of stuff. But there's always demand for in-person training, like people. Yeah. And, and as a decoy, like I'm mostly in the bite work space. You got, someone's got to get bitten, right? And that's <laughs> like, it, it's been weird because I kind of got to this pinnacle and, and it's been annoying with COVID. Like my career was headed in a particular way. And it's not that I wanted to get to there. It was like, I could see where it was going. And I'm happy to, 
you know, it can fall kind of anywhere, but I could see where it was going and now it's impossible because my dog got old, the things I was going to do with him, I can't do. Like it just kind of, a lot of things outside of mine or anyone else's control, it's kind of changed it quite a bit, uh, which is very frustrating, but we still have the podcast, still do it. And I'm still very much in the dog space and I'm still doing seminars and stuff. I'm just more particular about where where I do them and when I do them and that kind of stuff. So there was something you said that I uh, perked my ears up, especially with this crowd, right? Which is you're like, yeah, I'm really good on the tools, mm-hmm. but I'm also very good at explaining it. Mm-hmm. And I think that tends to be pretty consistent with a lot of our group. I would love to hear from, from your perspective as well as Matt's perspective, because I know what my process is on taking stuff in. So where I understand it well enough that I can then go teach it in a way that can be easily consumed taken in and then like exponentially put people ahead. Mm-hmm. I would love to hear from both you guys kind of how you view that process for yourself personally to get to the point where you can teach it. Mm. Well, I like to, I think I'm relatively obsessive, which is, I think very similar. Like me and Pat once were like, Hey, you want to lose weight? And we're like, yeah. Okay. We'll have a competition to see who can work out the most in 60 days. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had these met meters, you know, like the, like the, it was, you know, you get like points, right? You do a heart rate thing. And depending on what heart rate you have is like how many points you get. So I bought an assault bike and like, you can, it's like live updates. Right. And so I'd finish an hour workout on the assault bike, just punishing it. And then I would log into my app and I would see him working out walk straight back down. <laughs> right. It actually got unhealthy. Oh yeah. It was rid- like, I was working yeah. out, I was working out four to six hours a day whilst doing full time, everything. Yeah. This is Ross doing sales calls. And then like Pat ended up beating me. And like the last day I was like, I'd worked out 48 hours prior. I'm now mathematically eliminated. Right. Like I, I can no longer win. And so <laughs> I'd go to the boys and I was like, if you see Pat or talk to him, just be like, Hey, did you just saw Matt running like down there? It was so weird. Like, what's he doing like that? <laughs> and so he, he told me he, he called, like he called at 48 hours earlier. It's like, I, I can't in the time that I have, even at max points, I cannot catch up to where you are. And I was like, that sounds like something someone who's trying to trick me into being the place it would say. So until the midnight of the actual challenge ending, I was out running hill sprints until midnight, right? Like I finished work. It was a Thursday night where I, I worked Thursday nights. So I was like on my way home, went straight to the park and ran the hills from like nine till midnight. And you were working doing bite work. Yeah. Like not easy work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's why I have, I have out mapped yeah. tattooed right there. Because that, like, that was the bet. Yeah. So had to get a strong work. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. All right. Yeah. So obsessiveness is is the first thing. Would you say it's the same, Pat? Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. sure. I've noticed for me, it's the same thing as well, right? And that first phase, I like to categorize it as like the absorb everything phase. Yeah. Like, how do I dive into this and absorb everything? What's next for you? For me, I just have to understand the thought process of the person who's done it really, really well. So I just have to be able to ask why, 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 why. Or if I don't have access to them, I have to be able to rationally write down what the process is, like physically write it out and yep. then go like, what, why would you do it this way? What are the pros and cons of this? And then like when I was learning any PQ, I just wrote out the script and then I was like, okay, why would this, why would this be this way? This makes, like, I don't, I know it works and I know it must make sense for a certain reason. Why does it do it make sense? And then once I can understand that, then you're, you're, you're done because then you're like, oh, not only do I understand the how, but I understand the why. And then I can start to attribute that thought process to everything relating to it. And yep. so it starts to make everything very, very clear. And then you can tailor your training to get better at it, at the thought processes that you understand either the most or the least, depending on if you want to lean into your strengths or like lean into your weaknesses. You know, and so like with NEPQ, like when I was selling, I knew my natural strength was objection handling. So I didn't, I, I basically ignored everything Jeremy told me about objection handling until it was time for me to learn his way of objection handling because mine was so strong as it was. So I just focused on like the parts of it that I knew would create the highest value proposition change for me and then just dove through step by step. Yeah. And to be fair, Jeremy's way of objection handling is quite elegant the way that he does it. Mm. Right. It, it was actually the thing in any PQ that took me the longest to understand of Jeremy's besides, and this will sound funny, the way that he actually utilizes situation questions, which is the same way you, you utilize hooks. Yeah. That took me, those two things took me a very long time to understand. And you had a process that was a little bit more 
especially the way I've heard you describe it, is is a little bit more blunt, a little bit more, more hammer fisted. I wouldn't say it is. Uh, it's it's I, pretty blunt. I teach sales for dummies. Yes. Right. Like if you ever look at Marco, an inc- like incredibly elegant sales. Oh yeah. Beautiful. I have no to give about it. Like I have no intention to learn it. I don't care. It's beautiful. I will look at it. I will listen to it in awe. I have no to give. Right. That's because you shouldn't have to come in as head of sales and then learn not only Jeremy's style, but yeah. then your style and then Marco's style. Yeah. And then, so I had to decode everybody's style so I could understand what was being taught inside of Sales Sniper. Mm-hmm. So I then could actually just coach our reps. Yeah. It actually took me like months and months well, to the, figure out. The way out. I figured, Jeremy's so good. I was like, that is 10 years away. No matter what I do, it's 10 years, right? So I have to figure out the way that gets me the best in the shortest possible time so I created an EPQ for dummies. Yep. Like fully blown. This is the stupidest way you could possibly do this. But like, this is extremely effective. And then you reduce, like it's got so many things in there that now I don't do many of them at all. Because like I, it's yeah. like training anything, right? You have all these tricks that you use to like bypass skill. And then the more skilled you get, you don't need the tricks anymore. Mm. And so it, 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 there's pros and cons to doing it in each way. But like, the, that's why I can get, like very average salespeople to become quite good very quickly is because the way in which I explain things is the stupidest possible way to do it, but it is really effective. Well, and I think it goes back to something that you mentioned there, which is like kind of titrating up with skills as you go. So it can become more elegant because that uh, you taught me a hook a long time ago uh, when I was selling on one of our accounts where it was like, Hey man, this will sound super random, but it are like, most realtors I find are like either watch guys or car guys. Which one do you tend to lean towards? Yeah. I pulled that out the other day on a sales call because I was like, oh, it's the perfect spot for it. So I think it's having some of those things in your back pocket where you're like, this is where this is the right place as opposed to just utilizing it every single time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It allows you to price anchor. So you can establish a value of something that is essentially not of value. Like mm-hmm. a watch, who cares, right? If you're not willing to, sp- if I'm willing to spend 50000 on a watch and I'm not willing to spend 5000 on a course, I am a moron. Yeah. So you can just essentially price and value anchor, and then you can bring that back. So it, like it, it's a it's again it's a tool of the trade that you can use, and there's probably like you, like sort of like a ubiquitous concept across dog training or whatever. But it's like this is something you can use once you get good enough. You will not have to use it. Yeah. Something I've noticed you have, and and I'm guessing all the all the guys in sales have, and it's the same as what what I do, and pretty much everybody that teaches or, or presents is that you have like a hundred three minute bits and yeah. they're, they're in the Rolodex yeah. and someone says something and you go like, duh, 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 here's, here's this. And I've, I've said it a hundred times. It seems, it seems like it's genuine here now and it is yeah. genuine. I mean it like I'm not a, like a fake person, but I've, I've rehearsed this, this conversation. This is oh. <laughs> for you. This is a first time conversation, but I've had this conversation hundreds of times and here's the bit that comes out and I present you with that. And I see that when the sales calls that I've seen you guys do and it's like, there's recurring themes and because you're only, you're typically having the sales call with one person one time, they don't see your other calls with other people that, that it, it, to them, it is not a recurring theme. It's genuine every time. Um, and I see that like it's a, it, and that's a lot of content, like a hundred, three minute bits, you know, mm. 300 minutes is a lot of things you can pull out. And so there's a lot to build that. It's not like that's easy, but that's, I think the way that I see you guys do it. And, and when I teach, it's the same. So I want to ask a question. I'm like, yeah, I got that. Like I, this is not the first, it's rare that anyone asks me a question for the first time yeah. these days, right? Oh, hundred like percent. Plenty of times I've been like, oh, I'll have to get back to you on that one. But then for me, how many times have you just come up with something on the spot and you're like, ah, that was really. Yeah. Like you have that out of body experience where you're watching yourself answer it. It's like that scene <laughs> in old school where Will Ferrell goes up on there. He just starts talking. And he's yeah. like, I blacked out. What happened? What happened? Yeah. It's like that. It's like, Oh, I got to get that Zoom recording. I got to yeah. figure out what I just said. The first time I did that congruence hook, I was like, so it's like, hey, I already live with salespeople. They have that congruence of speech and action. In order to be a good sales guy, you kind of have to get out, of, you get out of your own way because you help people get out of their way for a living, right? And they go, yeah, yeah, congruence. And I go, yeah, 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 congruence. <laughs> and then I use that the whole way through, I anchor it with like, hey, like let's say we are able to help you become that really congruent, consistent salesperson. And you're able to make that extra 20K a month. What would you do? So we, we tie the outcome to, to being that person. 
And then the same thing with like the consequence of never achieving it. And then from there, when they give me like an objection, okay, that makes sense, man. Because like, but for us to be that really congruent salesperson that gets everyone out of their way, we have to first learn to get ourselves out of our own way. So what do we need to do to put yourself in a position to be able to, right? So you can just start riffing that. And then all of a sudden you, you start changing you start like le- like changing the decision making from buying something to being someone who can achieve, mm. and so it it makes like a binary choice: do I be a good sales guy or a bad sales guy? Because a bad sales guy can't even sell themselves; a good sales guy can sell themselves. So just do it. Mm-hmm. And that's like as soon as you start figuring stuff like that out, then you can start developing that for each type of person. And then that's kind of when you start going down the rabbit hole, and then you can just listen. You can hear a few different trigger words from the individual, and you're like, oh, I know the call that I'm having now. And then you just shift and then you have that call. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, Which goes back to what you're saying, right? Which is like, I have to understand the why behind what I'm doing. And then once I understand that why enough, right? I understand like, what am I actually looking for here, Mm -hmm. right? Then from there I can go, there's a variety of different ways I can get that. What makes the most sense? Yeah. And then I'd start playing with shit and kind of going from there. Was it similar for you and kind of your process and totally. how you break that down? Yeah. And, and, and not only with like training people, but even in actually training dogs, it's the same thing. And that's what oh. we teach in that you, first thing I got to do is figure out your motivation, right? Like, how am I going to, how am I going to reward you as a dog, right? Like, yeah. how am I, what is, do you want the ball? Do you want a game? Do you want food? Like, what is it that I can pay you with later? And they give that to you for free in the start. And then I've got to develop a system of communication prior to that so that I can say, that's correct. Here's the payment. And now I've got everything I need to manipulate the dog to do whatever I want with it. And so it's the- Exact it's, same with people. So you've it, got like status, money, yeah. significance, you know, like those sort of needs of people. Yeah. As soon as you figure out their motivators, then you can figure out the language patterns, yeah. which give them that. Yeah. That's yeah. why when you got deep into this stuff and I was so, you know, dog training is- behavioral manipulation. That's what you like. You're manipulating dogs, but the processes. We, we prefer persuasion. <laughs> well, see, this is the that thing. See, is we, we, yeah, that's right. So, so in my space, it's not at all. We know that's what we're doing. I'm yeah. manipulating this dog. But you I'm can't like, say punishment. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. right. I listen to your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's incredibly similar. And it all goes back to, you know, behaviorism. It's Skinner and it's Thorndike yeah. and it's all those people. And yeah, in the animal space, Skinner worked on a lot of rats and he worked on pigeons and dogs and that kind of stuff. But he never gave about rats, pigeons, and dogs. Like it was, it's mammal brains and it's people that he's going to do that stuff with. His biggest client was a CIA, right? So like it's- it's Never heard of them. (laughs) Manipulation is, well, what do you guys call it? You call it- Persuasion. Persuasion. It it all works the same. Mammal brains are mammal brains. What do you want? How do I show you a path to getting it? That's it. The, the, the difference in it, I'll articulate this for this conversation because it's probably important for the listener, which is like, the difference between persuasion and manipulation is persuasion is just something that you already wanted to do mm-hmm. or kind of clearing the path mm-hmm. in order for you to get there. Whereas manipulation may not be in your best interest. Yeah. And, and maybe I should use persuasion as well, <laughs> <laughs> but it is the same. It's that like, Hey, uh, there's a thing that you want and I'm going to show you how to get that. But in order to get that, it's via the thing that I want. Right? Yeah. And it's, it's just, Motivation is the key that, that it's in dog training and, and then in training people, it's all about motivation. Without that, you have nothing. And so when I figure out what is it that you want? Okay. Now I'll give it to you for free a few times. And then I go, oh, in order to get it again, now you got to do something for me and I'll give it to you again. Right. So right. here's a question I have for both of you guys. Right. So now you understand what's going on behind that. You're trying different stuff. There are a variety of good teachers out there and coaches and methodologies and way more bad. How do you start to wade through what's good and what's bad for you inside of that process as you're starting to get to that point of mastery? I like I learn in a very particular way though. So like I cannot absorb anything I read. I absorb everything I hear. Everything. Okay. Every conversation I have where I feel like it's an important conversation, I will retain basically a hundred percent of it. So every conversation you and I have ever yeah, had. Yeah, no, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean one or two of them. Yeah, yeah at, least, uh, at least one of them. Yeah. It's so like I have a very good retention. So like for me, like that way of learning and being able to interact with the person is extremely beneficial to me. So like how it's presented is really important for me. Like you can give me the greatest book on sales. I will get 14 pages in and go, what? What? I didn't read any of that, right? Because my brain just does not work that way. So I have to be able to like lay it out. That's why I like whiteboards and stuff and why you can see all this mad scribblings is because like that is how my, my brain works in like flashes of ideas and like clouds. Mm. And so like, I have to be able to put it out there visually and then make sense of it myself 
and then be able to ask questions about it. So for me, it's like the delivery mechanism is really important. Okay. So like something like an inner circle would work fairly well for me, but like for me, like having access to Jeremy for even four sessions was worth more to me than like, like for me personally than doing a group training model. Like when I was trying to learn some YouTube marketing, it was 30,000 for the year. I said, Hey, instead of me going to four groups a week, I would rather pay you 30,000 for five one-on-one -on -one sessions. Yeah. And I was like, are you happy with that? He was like, uh, I was like, just, I just want to see you once every six weeks. And I just have questions I need to ask you and then I'll be fine. I'll never bother you. And he was like, okay. <laughs> so that's kind of, and then I started to be able to dissect some of the processes. So the delivery mechanism for me is super important because I just want to ask, I have like four questions and it's just like, I need this, 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 and this. And those four questions will unlock all the things that I don't understand. And then I can move on. Mm. Yeah. It's really interesting because that's so different than a lot of the way that like the coaching consulting industry normally runs, at least in, in kind of the internet online world, like the rest of the world is a little bit different inside of like historic age old businesses. Yeah. But, but if you look at our staff portal and how I've laid it out, that's how I learn. So yeah. it's very short videos that have a high level of intent and a, yep. a very precise outcome for each video. So like I have to absorb information in small chunks that are ultra precise that then like stack on top of each other to unlock a concept. So how do you get like a baseline understanding of anything new where you don't have exposure to it? Like sales, you had a ton of exposure, but like if we took, uh, I don't have a great example. So hopefully you do have one in your head, but something that is relatively new that you want to grasp, uh, let's say crypto and understanding that, how yeah. do you start with that? Uh, and then get that baseline. It, if I become obsessed right with questions. it, if I become obsessed with it, I'll just consume all information that I can get my hands on, hopefully over a video. And then hopefully I can ask someone questions about it. So I was like, David would answer my questions. Yeah. Right. So, and David's like a crypto quadrillionaire. So I had access to a highly skilled individual, but like I got obsessed enough with it to where the first thing I did was get a coach. So not David, I got somebody else because like he was too yeah. busy. So I was like, okay, this guy can explain all the key concepts to me. I paid him a thousand bucks for 45 minutes, seven times. Yep. And then that gave me enough of a baseline to then when I could just go watch a bunch of videos. And then I just started playing around with stuff. So I was like, okay, I'll just, I'm willing to lose a thousand bucks. So I was like just moving money all over the space. And then if I didn't know how to do it, I would do a Loom video, send it to the coach, go, what have I done wrong? And he goes, oh, you got to remember how these interact. And I was like, all right, sweet. I know how to do that. And two weeks later, I, I knew crypto. Yeah, Not so like I'm really- super, and Enough to where I could do what I wanted to do. As soon as I could do what I wanted to do, I was done. Yeah, this is really interesting because I, I basically take in stuff the same way where it's like, I want the baseline of information, the foundations, and then I just want to put it into action. And like, I want to mess up because when I mess up, I can ask better questions or if I yeah. don't know stuff, then I'll clear those things up. And it's like five to depends. It can be like a hundred questions depending on how complex it is or how terrible I am at it <laughs> to get to mastery. But it, it, that foundation is key. And I think when I look at like our experience, like it's, it's the thing that I have reflected on a lot going, what allowed me to have any sort of like success that I have now? What is that foundation? Because I did not do it alone as much as like I could say, oh yeah, I built these businesses, blah, blah, blah. Like I, that's true. But I also had a ton of people over the years mentor me, pour into me, make sure I understood stuff, make sure I had it. And then obviously with our collective backgrounds, like it, the stakes are so high, you learn how to ask the right questions. Yeah, but how sure. fun is mentoring someone who really cares? That's what, oh, it's yeah, the best. That's what I was, so I've it's, been it's, mentored and I've mentored people I never have I ever asked to be mentored and nobody who's ever asked me to mentor them, have I? It's always a case. It, like, I think that kind of happens really naturally because as an expert, you see someone trying to become one you're like, oh, I can help you here. Right. And it's like, and they're, they're never people that come to you and they're like, please teach me this. You're like, right. But it's like, people are like, Hey man, I'm about 90% there. You reckon you can fill me in on that last 10%? I'm like, yes, totally can, right? Yeah. You show me that you've totally motivated yourself. You've pushed yourself forward. I'll plug whatever gaps I can for you, right? It's when people are like, I want you to teach me everything. It's like, yeah, yeah I agree on the everything, yeah. right? But I, uh, like I, I actually asked with the head of our board, Kim, I was like, Hey, can I get a, and I was like, what's the reasonable request you can't say no to? I was like, can I get a fortnightly 30 minute call? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
right? And I have like- Yeah, but no, but time out from the game because before you asked that, like I had him come to me with like, holy Will is doing some stuff. Yeah, that's right. It. Like you'd sent him, hey man, this is what I've done. This is what I've done. This is what I've done. Can I get feedback? Feedback. So like you'd already like presented him with like oh, yeah. three. Yeah. yeah. So like for you then going and asking, it, it's a it's a it's a foregone conclusion at that point. And if I have a look at like the people who I've mentored closely within Sales Sniper, which like, I was one of them. Yeah, for sure. It's like Road, right? Yash as well. Like Yash is, you know what I mean? But like it's the people who are like. And even like, uh, like Maggie recently was like, Hey, I'd love to do this. I was like, yeah, because like, I can see you have really tried to crack this nut Yeah. and there are a couple of things that are missing and I can fix that. Yeah. You know? So, but it's like, if someone comes to me and is like, just t like, even if you offer me money, I'm probably going to say no, because you yeah. haven't gone far enough down the road to where like what I present to you is of value to you because it's either going to go so far over your head and then I have to dumb it all down and start from scratch, which I really don't have any interest in doing. I agree with like, that. Like you have to go down the road. Like, you know, yeah. so that's, and that's well, and all I, part of it. I, I think that's a piece of it, right? Which is ultimately, I think, uh, where I was probably driving towards. I didn't totally know where I was going to take this point, but here we are. Uh, which is, I think once you get to a level where you are foundationally good in order to hit mastery, I can point to anything that I've achieved, any level of mastery, based on the quality of the questions that I've asked the people that are already past that. Yeah. So like what I do right now with Kim, because one, I just respect his time, but two, only have so much time myself, is I think a lot about what are the questions that would make sense to bring him. And I have my notes app on my iPhone and I just write those questions. And I go, what are the highest leverage? I used to do this with you too when we had the, when our weekly was more you mentoring me before that kind of switched into, you know, us working on growth and, and all of that stuff for the company, which was like, what are the questions that make sense to bring you here that I think you will enjoy answering? We'll stretch a little bit of the way you think about that, but will also allow me to fill in those gaps and build kind of these mental models that will move me forward. Mm and actually not waste your time where it's actually more beneficial to you. I think I totally agree. And one of the worst things people can do is when you go to the expert and you ask a question and you know, already know the answer for it. Like when, when I catch someone doing that to me, I'm like, you're wasting both our time. You want a pat on the back. That's what you're actually looking for is a pat on the back. And it doesn't work for everyone. It doesn't at all. But like, I don't need to be, I don't need someone to be nice to me, like in that space. Like, and uh, the guy that I first started with, who really taught me the the biggest first chunk of you know, really high end dog training stuff. One day I really got with the way he was talking to me and, and what he was doing. And I, I kept making mistakes, but it was a very technical thing that I was doing. And it was my first time doing it. And I pr got pretty angry about it and was visibly like pretty. And he came over to me and he said, Hey, we can stop any minute you want we can just stop doing this. Like you've asked me to train you. This is how I do it. If you want to just go hang out, we can go have a beer, right? But we're, then we're done here. So do you want to go hang out and just be friends or do you want to shut up <laughs> and get back to work? And I was like, I will get back to work. And I was like, that's, <laughs> that's how I want to be treated. I don't want to, I don't need someone that's got to coddle me. And that's not for everyone. Absolutely. That's not for everyone. But that's what I, I hate when people come to you and they ask a question to appear like they're asking a good question and they know the answer and you know, they know the answer. And it's yeah. just this theater. It's like, Hey, don't, let's not do this. Come to me with shit. You really don't understand. But I think that's like an element of vulnerability where people, you know, like I've come to you with uh, three questions that you answered so easily. I want to like have a bit of confirmation of a fourth, right? So that to show you where I'm kind of at. And I think that is a folly, right? Like yeah. There's also a large difference between questions and being questioned. Yeah. And I, I say that a lot. I go, hey guys, I don't mind questions. I go, being questioned is very different. And I go, you will get a much different answer and a much different tonality. But like, I'm not married to any particular way of doing things, but I'm teaching a very particular way of doing things. Mm -hmm. I was like, so like, if you want to go do that, I don't get, go do that. But we're talking about this. Mm. You know, oh, but Bill, I don't get, what Belfort says. So you can go do what you want. We're talking about this way. If you want to do that stuff, you can do that way. I can't teach that stuff. Mm. I don't know that stuff. Yeah. Right. So let's talk about this. Um, I think it all comes back to like in, in my mind, like I was, I need, I get angry during trainings, not angry, but I crack during trainings a fair bit when people ask the same question a lot. Right. Like if I get to the inner circle where I'm training people and the same people ask the same questions, I go, Oi, 
like, if you want to learn this, then like get obsessed with it and just can dive into it and make it everything that you need to be. Like, this is your world now, like become the best. Mm. And, and I think like with everything, if you want to be extraordinarily successful in something, you just have to obsess over it. Like when I learned NEPQ, like I was so blown away by it. I was like, oh, I was like, what is happening? I could not believe that a single person in one lifetime had put that together. I was oh, like, yeah, it's brilliant. It is brilliant. It is like beyond. I was like, wow, if you figure this out, you, you're multimillionaire. Like there's no if, ands, or buts about it. And I remember J the way that Jeremy thought of me, looked at me, treated me. As soon as I asked one question, I said, Hey man, are you doing this because of this? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, in 15 years, you're the only person to figure that out. And I was like, huh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, yeah, it does. And I was like, cool. Anyway, I had that. And then like a week later, he's like, hey, do you want to be my sales guy? <laughs> you want to be best friends? Yeah. <laughs> and, and we just become best friends? <laughs> yeah. And I think like with mentoring, my, my um, thought process on mentoring, I've said this before, is the worst case scenario is that they stay your mentor. Yeah. Like, that is the worst case. They need to become a friend that you can ask a favor of. Mm. And they need to be invested in your success. Mm. So like, if I want to get, like, if I get mentoring from Jeremy, like Jeremy is my sales mentor. He is the master. Now I have no intention, need, want, or desire to be as good at him in sales. And I've been very upfront about that. I am, I will get better naturally of my progression, but I will not attempt to. Huh. Right? right? <laughs> like, I would, like, I'm, it's all downhill from here. Yeah, I'm, Let's like, be I'm, I'm good enough. Right? <laughs> right? Like I've reached the, po the point of diminishing returns. But it was just like, okay, like if I can do this right and I can make Jeremy invested in my success, then at the point in which I ask him for a favor, which makes me more successful or for him to do something, then me achieving it makes him more successful because my success is hinged on him. Mm. And so when I went to him and I was the sales guy and I said, I can run this company better than the people who are company currently running it, give it to me and I will fix this. And he was like, okay. And that was it. And I fired everybody. <laughs> <laughs> fired everybody. All right. So I, I have another question and it, this is based on a conversation I had with one of our guys earlier. I did a coaching call with him. I don't know, probably about six months ago now. Uh, and then he stopped me as I was, as we were walking, I was walking, go take, take a leak. But he's like, Hey man, thanks so much for that session. He's like, you, you figured that out in like a very short amount of time. And I was like, well, yeah, man, as soon as I saw what you had going on, it was easy. I was like, you have a wealth of experience. You've been very successful in another place. Like you were so clearly on the role play that we did. And I saw within the first like three minutes trying to be somebody else that you were second guessing yourself. So I look at like the, the difference between being really good and being elite at the point of where you understand what you're doing so well you can just let your personality, your style, everything else come out, but you trust that you're still going to get the uh -huh. same, if not better outcome. Yeah. That I think is a thing that a lot of people struggle with, especially inside of sales, inside of business, re really performance in general, Yeah. which is even the people that start to understand the process, which is why you can role play for 12 hours a week. You can study any PQ, you can do all this stuff and you can still you can still realistically not have a high level of success, right? Yeah. You can still never crack 20K a month in comps does, or whatever Does that it is. translate to, do you see people trying to be Bart? Do you see people yeah, trying to oh, be- Yeah, 100%. And, and it 100% translates in that you really just have to understand the principles, the core principles. There's a framework, like there's a skeleton to it and everybody's got their own skin suit around it. And when you see someone who's learned from a particular person and they miss the skeleton and they try to wear their skin suit, and, and we see that- It's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, we see that all the time. And decoying is one of the biggest things, like teaching a dog to bite. It's a weird little dance with the dog. And there's principles, there's things you do, but everybody has their own flair. And very often you can tell who trains someone by the things that they do. Okay. And, and yeah. they- I can tell who, tra what, what, what training they've done by the way they sell. Oh yeah, yeah totally. God's Dan Locke, that's Belfort, that's Cardone. Yeah. That's and, yeah. And, and when you can tell who trains someone, they're never, they're going to be someone who was trained by someone. They're never going to be the person training someone else. Right. Because you would go to the original. 
right? Yeah. And so it, it's about sort of understanding, I get it. I understand the principles and I, like my brain works in flow charts. So like I see the flow chart. I know exactly. how you, I know the decisions that you're going to make and I'm going to make the same decisions, but it's going to be with my own flair. The flow yeah. chart's going to be the same, but it's going to be different colors and there's going to be different patterns all over it, but we're going to get to the same place. And we're going to get to the same place via the same mechanism, but to an observer, it might seem really different. Right. Ah, so here's an interesting thing, right? Because I've looked but at this. So all three of us come from a, a background where like we were fairly confident in what we did. Like I would say I had a very, very, very high level of confidence in my skill set when I was operating. I was able to, I actually second guessed. I it took me a while to translate that confidence into business for my first business. I always thought I was behind the curve. I always thought like Oh, I'm behind the curve. Like even when we're doing really well, like hitting high profitability numbers for a brick and mortar gym, all that stuff, right? I, I think it, you need that though. I do. You and I agree with that. But you also, <laughs> to hit an elite level, you actually have to get rid of that. It will hold you back. Yeah, I, believe say, that. I, I don't have that. So I, I here's, that, yeah, here's my question start, for you guys. That's what gets the hunger. But now- like, I agree. Yeah. At least it was for me. Here's my question. For somebody that doesn't have our background and so they don't have to go to combat for 10 years, right? How was that an option? <laughs> I wasn't aware. Well, right now there's plenty yeah. happening. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, Matt, for some of us it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <coughs> you guys were Check. both qualified Check. snipers, right? Uh, no. Were you? Uh, I wasn't aware. I was not. Oh. Thanks, yeah. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know that. Rem remind I me. Uh, I was- How many- <laughs> How many deployments did you get? Less than you. Inside of your ten years, significant less than you. I believe it's weird because we spent. Oh, we spent about the same amount of time, but you had seven. That's weird. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, um, I was very important back home, right? <laughs> I was the sniper. Oh, that's weird side. because all the work was overseas. But yeah. but that makes that makes sense. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, by the time by the time you were done with them, you'd already killed everyone. So <laughs> I, I said it so, to Bouge the other day. Bouge was like, "Oh, he called me a sniper." Like. You know, everyone's here the sniper, right? And I was like, oh, dude, I actually wasn't a sniper. And I was the sniper platoon sergeant, but I was neither of those things. <laughs> <laughs> a sergeant, nor a sergeant, nor a sniper. Yeah. <sighs> but you could imagine do, if you were, right? <laughs> how do you, especially now that we all coach other people, right? And their development truly is indicative of how successful we are in our roles. Mm -hmm. Like their success is literally. Which I would say so. very, if I'm speaking personally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how do you start to instill, because I have my own way of doing this and what I kind of look for in somebody. How do you start to go, that person has all of the foundation without the confidence to step into it on their own? And then how do you start to translate that and give them coaching and advice around that to actually become confident in who they are? Uh, I know how I do it, but it, um, first of all, I know if someone's good, like immediately. I can, I can tell if someone's you good for? from the first couple of minutes. It's, the, it's if they make the same decisions as me. If I do not understand where they're going in a sales call, because I should be able to listen in the same way that you should be able to watch someone coaching, uh, training a dog and go, okay, I get what they're doing here. Mm -hmm. If you look at it and go, what the f are they doing? Like then, then they're either on a different wavelength, which is working, but I can't work with them anyway because I don't understand what they're doing. But if I go, ah, oh, okay, I see what he's doing then like I can predict what's going to happen. And if they do that, I'm like, yep, their decision-making process is good. Now the execution might be poor. Like they might have poor tonality. They might be asking like the right question in the wrong way or at the wrong time. But that decision tree, that flow chart is the skeleton is there and they're making it, but just with small tweaks, they can get better. Um, now the people who are actually genuinely really good, like we have a sales rep who's phenomenally talented who just doesn't produce. Oh, yeah. Right. Phenomenally. Right. Like the guy who knows everything, does everything perfectly, but for some reason just can't train a dog. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it's, it's really interesting and there's a bunch of things, but what I generally do is try and remove the importance of the outcome. And I just go, your only job on, at the end of each sales call is to think, man, I did my process and that was a good call. So if we just remove the outcome and then we just insert the new outcome of I'm doing the process. If I do the process, it's good. And I should be able to hand that call to someone because you can't sell everybody. Like it's ridiculous to think you can. 
even if it's 99%, there's still one who's going to say no, uh-huh. right? So the moment you realize that you have no control over whether that person buys or not, like you literally have no control. And to pretend otherwise is like extraordinarily e- like egotistical or just insane. So I go, you can't sell them all. There's no point trying. If you sell at 40%, then you should be shocked when someone buys because 60% chance they don't. And so just focus on doing the process. And that's all I want you to focus on. And at the end of every call, you've done your process, you high five, that's it. If you get to that level, then you'll stop caring about the end result. You'll just start caring about the process. And then you'll become so obsessed with doing the process every time that the end result will come anyway. So I have uh, a threefold way to approach this that's developed over, because part of, part of my role, especially six, nine months ago at Sniper, was somebody was struggling. And then put him in jail. It didn't start out that way. It did end up that way. Yeah, we'll hang some jail. Yeah, so it, you it, up, you go to will. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is why everybody's afraid. So when you're I the slack sergeant messages. of arms. Yeah, that's literally exactly what it was. Matt yeah. didn't want to be the bad guy. I came on, and then he was like, "Hey, man, will you have a conversation with this person?" And this escalated, and I started to realize what was happening as it continued to happen. But one of the things I've realized, you hate it too, don't you? I don't mind it because of the amount of people that have come through the other side. Yeah, it killed the game. Right, like- Changed people's lives. Yeah, so now to be fair, like, and I've I've looked at the stats, like it's 60, 40, like 60% chance you'll come through, but 40%, you're probably done in sales. Like there's just no question. It's for the best. Mm. Writing your name on the wall in lipstick for the rest of their life. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Glad I called that guy. Um, (laughs) Oh, I'm so glad you guys understand movie quotes at such a deep level like I do. <laughs> so within that, the way I approach it first is I go, hey man, what is very similar to what you do, Matt? Like, what are you looking to do here? What were you looking for in that? It's like, oh, okay, you understand what's happening. And then if it's still not connecting, the usually the first thing that I do is I go, like, you know your process. We've walked through this. You're actually second guessing yourself. I can literally see your thought process which is you're going, oh, I should take them here. You're thinking about the way to formulate the question. And then you're going in. This is with people that have practiced like thousands of hours, right? They've been, they role play with like an hour a day. They go through this, like they, I mean, these are people putting in work. Like proper students. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they still, like they can do it in a role play, but but it's, it's just not connecting. And I go, all right, man, I think what's happening is you're actually thinking so much about what you need to do that you're not trusting the fact that you actually know what to do. You can hear their internal monologue. Exactly right. Yeah. So go, I will speed them up. And I used to, I, I got this actually from a- The 12 minute sale. So I, I do it a little bit differently than the way you do it. I, I took it from uh, one of my boxing coaches like probably 15 years ago at this point. Cause I used to do a little bit of the same. Cause I was, I was doing way more powerlifting at the time. So it was a little bit, more muscular, but I was not as fast and I was not as fluid. And so he was like, dude, you look like a refrigerator. Did you just call yourself muscular, fast, and fluid? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, mean <laughs> I did not you have eyes, right? <laughs> uh, you're welcome. Um, it's so, a real problem when, you know, we, so but he was like, hey, you look like a refrigerator that's trying to twist. Like, what the f- are you doing? And I was like, I don't Test. know, man. I think I, I think I know. No, no, no. I, I was just so like tense yeah, yeah. boxing. There was no fluidity to it. There was no weight transfer. There was no engagement in the hit. Like it just, there was a lot of shit met, like missing on a functional level. He's like, dude, and he just sped me up. He just went, all right, here's what we're going to do. And he just kept speeding me up and he put constraints on me in such a way that I had to stop thinking about it. And it was in that process that I could actually start to trust that I just knew what to do is because I was overpaced. So what I'll do is I'll overpace somebody, right? And then I'll go, hey man, you just did everything correctly, which means that you're literally just overthinking this. Mm. So all you have to do is just trust that you know what to do and just run through it because then you can actually just engage with the process. You can get into a little bit of flow. Quite frankly, I think you're gonna have more fun. You're gonna get a better outcome and like you can get out of your head and stop worrying about everything and feeling any sort of anxiety as you go throughout Mm. the day. And that with the people that I've gone through where it's clicked, all of a sudden just become savages. That's what happened with Yash in addition to some other stuff. Like when it clicked, it clicked. It's the same with dogs, right? Yeah, well, I was gonna say, I've got like a third way of explaining the same thing. Yeah, cool. Because we're all doing the same thing, but just explain it differently is that for me, I, I always go back to the excellence as mastery of the basics. 
And I always talk about, so I did the direct recruiting to SF thing. So, you know, I'm at the school of infantry and I'm doing all the infantry and I'm like, I hate all this bullshit, right? I can't <laughs> yeah. wait to be kicking indoors and doing cool guy stuff. I pass selection and I'm like, I'm ready to get issued my rocket pack and my laser beam. <laughs> and then it's like, no, the it's, sharks? Just, it's <laughs> just the same as the infantry. Like, but more of it at, yeah. at nauseum until you can do it in your sleep with your eyes closed, you don't have to think about it. And, and I was like, what? And that's when I realized, you know, excellence is mastery of the basics. And that's what I do with as many people as possible. I'm like, we need the, the basic stuff, like the kindergarten, the ABCs, you need to be able to do that without thinking. And then the more difficult tasks can occupy 100% of your brain while you're doing it, right? And so if you're still worried about the, the basics, then there's no chance of you doing the, the difficult stuff well. Get to the basics as like an automatic response that you don't even need to think about. And, and in gunfighter terms, I know it's what you sort of started with it, is it's that same shit. You see people like shooting, their gun stops, and then it's like, oh, like what's going on here? And yeah, and so what I want and what, you know, I'm sure all three of us would do is you feel that last round and you're, you're fixing that while I'm taking in new information, right? Because mm -hmm. the basics are happening, that's happening without me having to think. And the difference is I'm using that three seconds to find out battlefield information rather than fixing this minor problem here because that's happening automatically. And that's what I try and instill with people with, with the dogs when I'm getting them to train. And I imagine it's the same with just a lot. It's everything. What I want is those basic stuff to be like, I don't, that doesn't have to occupy any of my brain power. Yeah, exactly. It, all of my brain power can go to the more complex things, which allows me to appear way more competent than I am at the complex things because I'm super competent at the basics. Like the basics I'm all over and I appear like I'm really good at the complex stuff, but only because I, that's You've my 100% focus. Yeah, yeah, that's all I'm actually worried about. I'm not worried about any of that basic stuff because that's happening. I'm, I'm just finding it done. Right? Yeah, I feel like when you have the basics, right? If you don't have the basics, you have to worry about what you're doing wrong. When you have the basics, you can start to focus on what am I doing right and how do I do more of that? And I think that shift is where people go from like baseline good, starting to get up into an elite level mm -hmm. from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's like, it would be interesting to see if you could formulate some sort of uh, weird world ball and dummy shoot. Mm -hmm. Right. Like where you could sort of like have a thing which just obviously shows you what you're doing wrong. Cause that's such a, for those of you who don't know, ball and dummy shoot is where you have like dummy rounds in and you can see people flinch for the round. Right. You don't so, know whether you've got a live exactly. or a dummy so round. Exactly. It's, so it, it, you just see and people like that. No, that's not the you're of the gun. That's you doing that in anticipation, right? Like yeah. snatching the trigger and stuff. So it would be really interesting to try and like develop something like that where you could really kind of dissect what they're actually doing incorrectly in such a visual and like instantaneous manner. Cause I think like shooting, like I know for shooting in sales, like it was such a, it was such a good paradigm for me because, you know, like I was so used to just like, it's like we just shot every day. It's all yeah. we did. But, right? but it's dry practice as well. That's one of the things that the army drills into that. I think I see nowhere else. When I say to people like, don't, you don't have the dog here making all these mistakes in front of him. Put him away and you get good at it by yourself Yes, and then get him out. And it's like, no, but it's playing tug with the dog. Like it's presentation of the reward and all that. I'm like, he doesn't need to be around for your mistakes. You get good at that by yourself, right? Like set up lines so that you can do it in a straight line and all these kind of do it by yourself, get good at it and then bring in the dog so that he never has to endure your ups along the way. This is that, that's funny you mentioned. So uh, this is a, a parallel of the two worlds, kind of, which is when I started learning NEPQ, I went into, which I don't even think we do anymore. I just went straight into inner circle, you right? I had no 2.0, no 3.0. Uh, I just went straight to inner circle. So I went through the entire portal on a weekend, uh, just ripped through the content. I still have all the notes on in notability on my iPad. It's like yeah. hilarious, right? And then from there, I just started role playing, but I role played for like an hour to an hour and a half every morning. Mm -hmm. And all I did, I've got an English lad named Sawyer, right? And he would sit at my feet and I would just sell Sawyer. <laughs> I sold Sawyer so many high ticket packages. I cannot even describe to you. Yeah. But all I did is I just, I went, what is the, what is the closest way that I can replicate this? Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to open Zoom. I'm going to be at my desk. I'm going to have my script up the same way that I would during a sales call because it was still very much using a script back then. And I'm just going to run through that over and over and over again until I start to get happy with it, mm. which took months and months and months. It just seems so obvious though. One thing that used to but really show people would come in 
Well, it's because being bad at our previous job had pretty severe consequences. Yeah. Right. So I think that, like there's a there's a different of like catastrophizing failure. Yes. Right. That that happens. And so I remember. Do you still like, do it, by the way? Um. Yes. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, I have totally. a lot. I, I get like totally. I get. Yeah. I spiral with like one thing, and it will like ah like that, and then I like anyway. I fix it. But um, that's why Kim's good. It's good to chat to Kim. Uh, yeah, that, that's worth talking about because outwardly that can be. I'm sure. I, well, maybe I'm not. Maybe I, maybe this is just me. But tell me, uh, outwardly you can be very confident. You can do what you want. But the reason why I have obsessive, you know, laser focus is because of a critical fear of looking stupid. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like an absolute, like you know, all the all the catch cries, imposter syndrome, and all those things. Like I have a crippling fear of being found lacking. Because in a former job, being found lacking was like you let the team down, you got someone killed. You're like, it, it's, it oh, was, yeah. so it's, cr- that is a crippling within me, that, that fear. And that's why I get hyper obsessed with things. Not only because I'm working towards something, you know, obviously I, that's my primary motivator. I'm trying to get towards something, but I got a bear chasing me at all times. Oh yeah. <laughs> I had, uh, I, there was a point in time where I, I was, we had like 13 North American accounts. It's not that long ago, by the way. I was running all of those internal meetings every Friday. So every Friday was a 20 minute meeting stacked back to back for about four hours Mm -hmm. where I went through the numbers and then it was just find the bottleneck, find the issue, fix it, or come up with a plan to fix it or set it on the side because we're out of time. And then Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I'll come up with a plan to fix it. And it went through all those. And eventually we we had a guy, Sean Ray, shout out to Sean, if you're listening, uh, who started riding shotgun with me on these and now has taken over a lot of this role as my role kind of morphs here at Sniper. And he asked me one day because like, he's like, hey man, how do you know that question to ask that person to get there? And I was like, oh, well, I just saw this and this. He's like, yeah, but I wouldn't have done that. I go, he goes, where did that skill come from? <laughs> and I had no better answer than like, I don't know what to tell you, man, like nine combat deployments and me being like, like uh, over, uh, like the way you describe it, like uh, overwhelming pressure yeah. and anxiety to make <laughs> sure that all my fear. guys go home <laughs> yeah. and that we don't this up. Yeah, I'm like, that's what drives me. That's why I won't just accept a mediocre answer. I don't understand, or it's not something that's connect, or I didn't really fix the problem, or I don't understand it is because now that's a structure that plays in my brain over and over again, that serves me really well. But it was this overwhelming anxiety for you know, a decade of, am I measuring up to this? Mm. Am I taking care of my guys? Am I doing everything that I need to? And I know we use this as a reframe now, but like to make sure we get the best possible outcome there and I can be at peace with no matter what happens. Cause I know I did not slack at all there. That piece of it, I think has served me really well, mm. but I also have struggled with how do I keep that in check to know when, when is good enough? Mm. So how do you guys do that? Especially if we're talking about elite performance, I know we're going a little long here, but how do you guys start to keep that in check for you personally? Because I think a lot of our listeners are going to fall into that category where they, it starts to become somewhat anxious when they think about their performance. On my podcast, The Canine Paradigm, we did a whole hey, episode on good enough is exactly that, right? Like it, people think of good enough as being like close enough. Those are really different things. Oh, yeah. Good enough is exactly that. It's It's got to be good enough. I can't fail. Right. And so, you know, I sold two dogs this morning, right. And they, they were sold at a a relative spec, but they were miles ahead of that spec. right? And the people who buy them don't need to know that because they will figure it out when they start working the dogs, but they had to be good enough to pass. Now, no matter what conditions got thrown at them in their assessment, they had to pass. Right. So in order to make sure that was going to happen, they're 10 times better than what they needed to be in order to get there, because that's all that was good enough. They have to be good enough at every level, right? Like it at every measure, which means you have to be exceptional at some and kind of okay at others. Right. Like there's a, there's a spectrum of things, but you, you can never be found lacking. It has to be good enough all the time across everything, no matter the conditions, which means sometimes it has to be exceptional, right? Sometimes it has to be perfect so that on the day it can be good enough. Yeah, that's interesting. Matt, how do you approach this? I don't know. To be honest, I get so obsessed with being the best at what I'm doing. I can't think of anything else. Like it's like, and it was, uh, to be honest, I wasn't that way in the military. I, I took my job far less seriously than what most other people did. 
And I think that was probably reflective in a few <laughs> <laughs> Younger right. days, younger Noted. days. Yeah. Um, like, although I thought the job was serious, I didn't feel like we needed to take ourselves seriously. Mm. And in the very, very, very small realm of snipers, where the egos are very high, yes, that was not seen upon as a positive. Yeah, it was almost like having a uh, uh, personality where you didn't just hate the world was yeah. frowned upon. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> hey guys, like, let's be really good at our job. But like, we are not better than anybody else. And I, I've tried to reflect that here. I And I think in a really, that's interesting. I came to that conclusion later on, probably actually towards the very end of my military government career. I did not have that for the first seven years. I Like I didn't. Mm-hmm. I Like it, I was absolutely on board with everybody where it was like, you either perform or you're a total piece, you're dead to the world. I never understood it. I, I knew it was a thing. I never understood it. Like if someone overseas and they're a piece, I was like, oh, you're a piece because you just really put someone in a bad spot. Like, but in terms of like, I just never understood. Like I never understood treating the mechanics different than the shooters and the snipers different than more. No, well, I didn't like, treat them different as, a, I actually was way cooler with support. It was actually, I held- In snipers where I was, it, that, no. So it was not allowed. We were better and we knew it. Yeah, so like, that, like that was the attitude. <laughs> that was the overwhelming. I never had that same thing actually where I held people to that standard was actually just our guys. So I was like, if you choose to do this, right. And like to illustrate the model, like it's it's here, right? Like we have three bullet holes and then a crack down the skull, Mm -hmm. right? The three bullet holes are for the only three things that you'll find in the recon community, which is pain, misery, and suffering. (laughs) And the crack is for perseverance. And that is your life. (laughs) That is literally the entire mentality. Yeah, yeah. So I held like that standard that I held myself to was so high that I held everybody else to it. The but the curious thing that you said in there is you're like I'm so obsessed with being the best, right? But especially in the role that you're in right now, you could be really good at growing a company, but because it requires such a constant up leveling of skills, and then becoming more and more aware of different things that are happening there, you actually at least from my perspective, and and you might view this different, which would be a really interesting conversation. I don't think either you or I could be the best at any single one thing that we do in Sniper. I um, hope not. Exactly right. Yeah. So it then becomes like, we are very, very, very good at attracting talent and then getting culture pervasive. But when you say- Yeah, but you don't know what I want best, to be the best at. That's what I was curious about. When you say being the best, what are you looking at? And yeah, I'm you- Thanos. And I'm collecting those stones. You're like, that is my job. Tell us more. My job is to collect the greatest human beings and unite them under one singular vision. Like that is my job. That is my only job. And if I get enough really, really cool people who are really, really good and really, really bought into the snap, right? Then like, there's no amount of people that can stop it from happening. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. And we're- yeah. pretty close right now. Yeah. So, it makes me feel good about a fake job he gave me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like the stone on the elbow. It's not like doing anything, but it looks good. It's important yeah. that it's there. Yeah. So like, that's actually, that's what, you're the bedazzled jean jacket. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> the bedazzle. <laughs> yeah. So like, that's what, that's what I have to be good at. Like I have to be like the guy that is out in front rallying the troops and like attracting like through like pure force of will, like come to me if you want to live. You know what I mean? Like that's interesting because I, I have really had a thought about this over the last month or two as my role is shifting at sniper and gone. What is, what is the overarching thing that I didn't use terms of like, want to be the best at, but like, how do I provide the absolute most value here to our team? Yeah, I like, well, I think we'll go over that a lot. Like we have planning sessions for the next 48 hours. Yeah, know? but yours in collecting people, mine actually I think is a little bit different, which is how do I empower those people to step fully up into what they're capable of in each position? Yeah. Now, how we do that is is variable and complex and depends on the person, role, all that stuff. And I have some thoughts and we've already been doing it. But it's uh, it's interesting where it's almost like you can't go wrong. Right. And I look at this over and over again. Like, I just don't think you, and to the point, like we've all been on great teams. We've all been on okay teams. And like, I've been on bad teams, right? Like, I think it boils down to, 
I think something that you talk about, Matt, all the time, which how do we set that unifying vision where we're moving towards it? But also, I think with the very, very smart people, one of the things that I actually overdid as my role shifted, and I look at it, and it was a learning lesson for me, reflecting back on it over the last couple of months, because I was I did a lot of work in a, a relatively short amount of time to transition my role over to Jeff and to Sean. But I was like, oh, I need to prepare them for success. And I actually got a little too obsessive on it. And it was like, no, 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 these are really smart people. Yeah. I need to just let them come in there. But I was so concerned with how do I make sure that I can hand this off in the right way to them that I actually overdid it a little bit. Whereas I feel like you go the opposite way. You're like, hey, man, here's what we need to do. I mean, there's go. two ways to teach people how to swim, right? <laughs> chuck like, them in. You can either chuck them in and you'll probably figure it out or you can allow them to go step by step. And I think both ways are valid. However, like you would choose some people to throw in and you choose some people to walk in. Yeah. Right? Like my son, I would never throw in. It's not how he operates. My daughter, I could throw her in and she would like, that's me and her are very similar personalities. She looks just like my wife, acts just like me. My son looks exactly like me. Is she, he is my wife, right? Like, like the same sort of things. So like, it just depends on who you are and, and, and sort of like, I like to figure out, go, okay, well, like, you know, like with James, like we're, we're partners, but I, like I've known him for a long time and I've mentored him for a long time and how I treat him in terms of like when I was sort of mentoring him through different things, like it was very step-by-step, you know what I mean? And he's yeah. very intelligent, so he picks up things really, really quickly. But like, I would not throw shitloads of responsibility on him immediately. I would, I would parse them off, you know? So but like, like I bring Pat on and I'm like, hey dude, I'm overwhelmed. I can't do this anymore. Like, just go do it. And he's like, oh, okay. Like, I'll go do this. And it's, it's like, I have ultimate, I just know it's going to work. Yeah. I just know. It's like, oh yeah, sweet. Like, Will's going to come on. All right, Will, you go do this now. Let me know if you have questions. Yeah, you threw literally uh, with zero, this is how you do it, over and over again. I was like, hey man, we're thinking about <laughs> this other retreat came about. You're like, hey, I'm thinking about a retreat. I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, man. He's like, ah, yeah, oh, I'm cool. glad you mentioned it. You want to <laughs> you want to take care of that? And I was like, yep. Do we have like a budget? You're like, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Like uh, 20 to no more than 50 grand. I was like, that's a pretty big spread, but- <laughs> Okay. And started running with now $120,000 later. <laughs> so that was a learning lesson. But I, I think actually I preferred that. Here's the, here's the thing that needs to happen. You be your grown ass man. And like I'll if, work back. Of course. Like that, that, that's but not I ever, prefer. but I don't think that's, that's totally fair. In. Right. No, the thing is, this is the thing about snipers is snipers are the only people in the military who are told what to do, not how to do it. Fair. That is the, there is a mandate. I need this done. Nobody understands how they do things or, you know what I mean? There's too many nuanced compartmentalization when it comes to snipers as a skill set that like the, the upper management, like the, the brass, they, they can't know. So they just go, oh, we just need this done. And then snipers plan. They don't tell what they're doing. They just go, this is what we need to facilitate and you go do it. So yep. like that, that is how I function best. I go like, just give me the outcome. I will try if you have a blueprint like I'll give give it to me so I can watch it and then I can try and figure it out myself but I think like for me that's how I that's how I do it best I much prefer that way um I don't like having to follow strict systems and processes in the beginning I like to kind of make my mistakes I think mistakes are extremely important to the learning process as long as you're tracking it and all that kind of stuff so like that's how I prefer but again you just got to pick and choose like I wouldn't you know um like even Ben for example like tossing him in the deep end is not super beneficial to his personality. So like we have to, like, it's been a very systematic, like increasing of responsibilities. Right. And a lot of that's happened from like me and James, cause I brought Ben in, like he was like the first big hire that we did from a pure administrational standpoint. And so it's been a very titrated sort of uh, responsibility over the last 12 months because we hired him in January of last year. Yeah. Right. So like it was a much smaller company then. So there's been a really good titration to throw him into this. What it is today would, would be very difficult because he's so analytical and so like process driven that to drop that man into the madness would, would be very difficult. But if you can do it in the right way, he'll like crush the game. You know, so everyone's just different. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. We're going pretty long. Yeah. Mm. Good spot to wrap it up there. 
Yeah, I think that's a good spot as any. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, if you like this kind of content, guys, make sure you comment down below. Let us know what your thoughts on certain things that we went over today. How do you like to be trained? How do you like to train people? What are some things that you want to be mentored in? And how do you want to be mentored in them? Yeah. That's an interesting conversation. Yeah. Let me know if you like the style of the YouTube videos that are out because- I do have a real job. <laughs> it's not a totally <laughs> fake job. <laughs> I am doing stuff. A real job, literally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. All right, guys. So make sure you like, subscribe, and the notification bell, all that kind of good stuff. If you are listening to this audio only, make sure you hit the sub button and share this with someone who could find some benefit from it. But thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll speak to you guys soon. Put that coffee down. Down. down.